Okay, good morning to all of you. Good to see you. Good morning. 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 The reason I'm over here is we have a, a treat for you today. We have a gentleman who's going to be talking to us all the way from Canada, and that's probably going to strain his voice quite considerably. That's a long distance. But anyway, good morning to all of you, and it's good to see you. Is he on yet, or is he listening? He's listening. He's listening. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. But anyway, uh, this uh, the gentleman you're going to be hearing here in a sermonette here is, uh, uh, and oh, last week, let me tell you something, I've got to make an announcement. Last week I told you that, that uh, my brother was going, had a few remarks to make, and then I remembered I already asked Mr. Harrison here, so uh, he'll, he'll wait till next week, but... Uh, he's got some things that he feels my brother does that God has laid on his heart, but I'm going to let him come next week. But anyway, today, uh, Steve Harrison is a graduate. Um, is he in master's class? No, we don't do master's online. That's right, that's right. So he has gotten his bachelor's degree from Ambassador and is very, very knowledgeable. Step forward. Do I need to get a little closer? That, no, it's the light, the way you're standing, the light's all I see. Oh, okay. But that won't matter. But anyway, no, it won't matter. But anyway, I want to ask God's blessing on our service today. I want to welcome all of you. Glad everybody came out today. I know it's cold, but hey, this is a good day to worship God, come together and study his word. So let's ask God's blessing, and then I'll, I'll present to you our speaker. Father in heaven, thank you so much for each one who's come out in the cool weather today. We thank you for this beautiful day we've got here. And we ask your anointing and inspiration on the messages and also on our hearts that we may comprehend and discern your truth and see how we should be living in these last days. We ask your blessing on this entire service in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, anyway, I uh, welcome all of you, and I also want to welcome our international audience, and I think it is just, it needs to go down a little bit like that. We should have looked at that beforehand. So if you push that side down, we're trying to get it where we're not standing on our side. Yeah, that's better. That's much better. All right. So without further ado, I want to present to you our, our speaker who's right here behind me right who's here. Who's on the screen now. Who's on the screen now, Mr. Stephen Harrison. Well, good morning. Good morning. I, uh, I, I will try to shout loud enough to be heard there in Kannapolis. <laughs> so I, I was talking to Dr. Slough last, last week uh, on um, Tuesday. And uh, he asked me if I knew what I was going to talk about today, and I, I told him quite honestly, no, I didn't have any clue. Uh, I know that each week Dr. Slough uh, asks God what, what to speak about, and uh, I've, I've always tried to do the same thing. And uh, I, I don't claim inspiration, but I'm hoping a little bit of guidance. Um, so... That was Tuesday. On, on Wednesday, uh, nothing. Quite, quite often what happens for me is uh, not just for something like this, but for anything in life, a question that I just don't know the answer. Uh, I, I'll ask, and at some point, God will put someone in my path or something in my path that, that has the answer. And on Thursday morning, I, uh, while I was having breakfast and getting ready for work, I was uh, listening to um, some videos um, from 2016. Um, with your election uh, coming up, I, probably a lot of Canadians follow it much more closely than you would necessarily follow ours. Um, but um, I was watching a, a video from election night, 2016, and um, it, it kind of started at the at the beginning of the evening and ended at the end of the evening. And at the beginning of the evening, um, it, it was pretty much uh, guaranteed that uh, Secretary Clinton was going to uh, break the glass ceiling. Um, well, you you know better than I do how that actually turned out. And as the evening progressed. Even when it reached the point where they still weren't willing to call the election, um, they had already begun to talk about why things were turning out differently than they had anticipated. And uh, one of the uh, political pundits said something that as soon as I heard it, I, I knew that that was the answer. And what, what he was talking about, to, to lay out the context, is he, he was talking about how important a clear message was. 
and he said if you if you had walked through an airport or mall you saw those t-shirt kiosks and they they had the the Trump t-shirts and the Trump hats with make America great again and that was a message that resonated with people it meant something and then when you looked across you saw the t-shirts for the Clinton campaign that said Clinton 2016 which said nothing and then he said the thing that I knew was the answer to my request he said it's sort of like that old saying which I had never heard before I had never heard it so I don't know if it's really common and I just don't get out much or whether it isn't and and I looked online and I can't find who actually said it so I can't attribute it to them but what it was is if you build a church without Jesus you built a warehouse and as soon as I heard that not only did it strike me with how correct it was but how how this this was my message and if anything I would tweak it a little bit I think it's a little imprecise and maybe not quite blunt enough and if I were going to say it I would say if you build a church without Jesus you built a morgue now warehouse is where you store things but specifically a morgue is where you store the dead until you're ready to bury them and there are a lot of churches out there that are basically morgues I actually heard someone tell a joke that some churches are so dead that if someone had a heart attack and died and the coroner came to get them they'd have a hard time telling which one it was and that's sad but unfortunately it's true and as I began to think about that I thought that very broadly speaking you could divide it into two sort of dead churches the first is where Jesus is not worshipped at all he's not praised he's not spoken of he is not mentioned if Jesus showed up on their doorstep they probably wouldn't recognize him and if they did recognize him and did let him in they probably wouldn't be all that comfortable around him the second the second is different in the second Jesus is actually spoken of he's preached sort of yet in kind of a neutered sort of way it's a almost a different Jesus he's worshipped and he's praised love you Jesus worship you Jesus praise you Jesus but don't be getting up in my grill sticking your nose in my business but isn't that kind of what having a Lord is isn't having a Lord someone who is the center of your life who actually decides the direction that your life should be going in is it possible to worship some version of Jesus and have it be meaningless the answer is yes Jesus himself said in Luke 46 or rather Luke 6 and verse 46 and why call ye me Lord Lord and do not the things that I say it simply isn't enough to to worship or praise Jesus without actually following his message his teachings in, in, in Matthew 15 9 we're told in vain they do worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men the end of both of these churches might come as a very sad surprise to some of the people in it Matthew 7 verses 21 to 23 reads 
Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doth the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we have prophet, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. That's harsh. But I guess it's difficult to poke your nose into someone's life if you don't even know them. So they kind of got what they asked for. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Ye that work iniquity, that's kind of a fancy Bible way of saying you bunch of sinners. Out you go and don't let the door hit you in the, well, don't let the door hit you on the way out. <laughs> the church can and should be um, a huge influence on us as Christians, uh, the way we develop, the way we learn, the way we grow. And that makes choosing a church important. So in choosing a church, don't choose a church based on the popularity of its pastor, how many talk shows he's been on, how many politicians he hobnobs with. Instead, choose a church whose heartbeat is the gospel. And, and don't choose a church based on how comfortable its pews. You, you know, the dead are actually quite comfortable. They don't feel a thing. Choose instead a church that teaches that Christ is both Lord and Savior. And don't choose a church based on how many bodies it contains. Instead, choose a church that's part of the body of Christ. Does your church preach the full counsel of God? Does it truly lift up and praise the name of Jesus and all that goes with that? Does it call sinners from a sinful world to repentance? Does it teach the commandments, the Sabbath, the holy days? Does it call Christians to a higher standard of living? Does it call sin, sin, and does it cry aloud and spare not without regard to what that will do to attendance or its income? Choose a church, not a warehouse, and not a morgue. Happy Sabbath. I didn't mean to do that. I was moving there. You turned them off. I, I'm on happy. That was not that just. Dropped, that was dropped the mic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was. That was not just for our people here, but for the untold numbers of people who are watching online. Because there's a lot of people watching online. Saying we didn't need it. Well, <laughs> yes, we we needed it. Yes. Everybody needs it. But don't think he was pointing it just at this crowd here. There's a lot of people out there that that really, that I happen to know, are in dead churches. Because he's talked. I was in one of those dead churches, and they understood you're supposed to keep the commandments, and, and you're supposed to be obedient to God's law, and so on. Even though we're under grace, we're still supposed to be obedient. They understood that. But I told this one young lady one time, I said, you know, I've, I've truly had a born-again experience. And she said, you, take, them, take me home. She thought I was a heretic. So I took her home. We were, we were um, at a church convention, and uh, she was in my car. We were going to a restaurant. It was our first and only date, and we never got to eat. <laughs> I know it, I know it. But anyway, I appreciate that message. And uh, do, does anybody have any questions or comments on his message before we get started? 
One of the things that we must do is talk about things that are relevant. Um, right now, we're facing a major election, and we have Christians that are apathetic, don't care which way America is going, don't care what's going to happen to our country, and that's a shame. They are apathetic, but then some of them are in de denominations that don't believe in voting either or organizations, even non-denominational churches, that say, well, voting is not for the Christian. Christians should not vote. We should not participate in government elections. And they're very sincere about that. I used to belong to a church like that back when I was 18 years of age and, uh, and into my 20s, and so I didn't vote because we were told that was spiritual fornication if you voted. Now, I want you to think about the logic of that. If every Christian in America joined that church, who would be voting? Who would be determining our government? Atheists? Agnostics? The devil? The devil's crowd? They would be running our government. So I want you to think about that. There was a church up in New England in the 1700s, uh, and they, their major doctrine was celibacy. And I can't remember the name of it, and you're probably saying, well, where are they today? Take a guess. If if everybody on earth said, hey, that's the true doctrine, and everybody joined it, where would the human race be today? There wouldn't be anybody left. Yeah, we'd all be gone. And you see, it's the devil's, the celibacy is a doctrine of the devil. Let me tell you why. Jesus chose not to get married because of his ministry. John the Baptist did as well, apparently. And Paul said, I could take a wife, but I don't want one. Okay, that's fine. It's not wrong to be single. But <clears throat> the doctrine of celibacy is not a doctrine of God. It's a, it's a it's a doctrine of, of the devil, and I'll tell you why. Because if the devil could get everybody to believe that doctrine, he wouldn't have to worry about doing anything else. He wouldn't have to worry about deceiving everybody. Satan wants to destroy this earth. He wants to destroy the human race. He hates you because you're made in the image of his God. Remember, God created him too. Dr. Wallace said it's the shakers. Shakers? Oh. Okay, that's why you don't hear much of them. Shakers, yeah. Everybody's got to be celibate. In fact, I saw a, 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 a radio program like 15, 20 years ago where they interviewed one of the last of the Shakers, this very, very, very elderly woman who had never been married, and she was one of the last. Guess why? America is facing judgment because of the national sins of this country. So where is the fear of God today? 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 2, you don't need to turn to all these, but I'll give you the references, and you can write them down and look them up. It says in the last days, verse 1, in the last days, perilous times will come. And one of the things that it mentions is blasphemy. Back in the 1950s, you didn't see blasphemy against God like you do now. A few years ago, I was watching some kind of a movie, or I was turning through the channels. I know what the movie was. And they were bleeping out certain sexual words, but when they take the Lord's name and thing, they left that in. That was okay. Because that's how it is today. People don't pay attention to what God's word says. They don't care what God thinks. We're all, we also read in verse 3, it says, In the last days they'll be without natural affection. But there's a lot of the unnatural kind today, isn't there? I mean, even our, even our government's involved. You know, they got their their hands in. Oh, yeah, let's let men get married to each other. Listen, marriage is not a civil institution. It's a holy institution. God created marriage, and God didn't create Adam and Steve. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Steve. <laughs> well, he created that, Steve, but not for Adam. <coughs> he created that Steve for Donna. <coughs> he created that Steve for Donna, and he created Eve for Adam. In fact, Le Leviticus 18, I was just reading this Thursday night to our bachelor's class. Leviticus 18 says that's not just a sin, it's an abomination. If you look up the Hebrew word, and I can't pronounce it, it starts with a T if we transliterate it, but the Hebrew word means disgusting and repulsive. Look it up yourself. Abom the word sin is kata in Hebrew. It means to miss the mark, like the Greek word hamartia. It just means to miss the mark. That means you're trying to do the right thing, but you keep slipping up. That's a sin. But an abomination is where you deliberately go out and do something that God considers to be disgusting and repulsive. You can look that up yourself in Hebrew. Now, 1 Timothy 3.15 says, tells us what the house of God is. It says that thou mayest know how to behave thyself in the house of God, comma, which is the church. So the house of God is the church. And the Bible tells us in the book of Ezekiel that when the judgment comes, begin first at my house. Now you think about that. 
Now, I'm not turning to all these scriptures, so, but I'm going to give them to you, and you can write them down. Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, those two chapters, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 says, if you obey me and you keep my commandments, you'll be blessed coming in, you'll be blessed going out. You'll be blessed in the city, you'll be blessed in the field. Deuteronomy 28, verse 11, I remember, says, and you'll be plenteous in goods. So God's going to prosper you with, with material goods if you'll obey him. Then you start in verse 15 of chapter 28. It says, but if you don't keep my commandments, you'll be cursed in the city, you'll be cursed in the field, and you'll be cursed coming in, you'll be cursed going out, and you shall not prosper in all your ways. Not prospering, another way of talking about poverty, is one of the the curses for disobeying God. Now, somebody's going to say, but wait a minute. Leviticus 26 deals with Israel, the chosen people. A lot of us are Gentiles. Maybe everybody in this room is a Gentile. We're not Jewish, but, you know, there's other, there's other tribes too. Some of you may have some of, the, some of that Israelite blood in you. I don't think I do. I think I'm full-blooded Gentile. Does this apply to me? De Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26 is written to Israel. But wait a minute. Romans 2.11 says God is no respecter of persons. What, would God not judge Gentile nations as well? Is it only for Israel? Let me ask you this. Were the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, were they Israelites? Were they Jewish people, for example? No. Did God pronounce judgment? Yeah. Why? Because of their sin. Not just their sin, but their abominations. And God doesn't change. Malachi 3, 6, I'm Lord, I change not. And he's, he's no respecter of persons. He never has been. He never will be. So does God know what America is doing today? Now, <clears throat> what about Nineveh? Were they Israelites? God pronounced judgment. 40 days and you're dead. Jonah goes in there and he says, you're going to die in 40 days. God didn't say go in there and tell them to repent. He just said tell them you're going to die. In other words, God had had it up to here. You don't get any more chances. You're going to be dead. Well, why mention 40 days? It did give them a chance, didn't it? And sure enough, Nineveh repented. If America repents, we're good. If we don't, then what happened to Sodom will happen to us. If you do, you've heard the sort of expression, if you do what so-and-so did, you'll get what so-and-so got. If you do the same thing they did, if we do what Sodom did, we're going to get what Sodom got. But you don't hear that preached much in our churches. So God pronounced judgment on Nineveh. He pronounced judgment on Babylon. These people weren't Israelites. He pronounced judgment on Egypt. So do you think God won't judge America? If you got your Bibles, you might want to turn with me to Jeremiah 25. Jeremiah was a great prophet of God who declared judgment on not only Israel, or in that case, the Israel was already gone, but the Jewish people. But he also pronounced judgment in the last days for all the nations. <clears throat> Now, it was uh, <clears throat> Tuesday night, and I'm listening to some of the things that are going on with the, the um, hearings for um, Amy Coney Barrett, and I was thinking about the fact that we need Christians to get out and vote pro-life, pro-family, not homosexual. And by the way, I don't hate homosexuals. That's not homophobic. God is not homophobic, but God hates the sin. He doesn't hate the sinner, but he hates the sin. And I've never, I don't even know any homosexuals, but if I met one, I wouldn't hate him, but I'd try to lead him to Jesus. I'm not saying that uh, God hates people who do certain sins, but God says repent. People say, but I can't help it. I was born that way. Number one, there's no medical evidence of that. And number two, even if you were born that way, the Bible says to him that overcometh, to him that overcometh. Revelation 2, 26, to him that overcometh, I'll, I'll give power over the nations. You can overcome. You can change. You, the, the word conversion means to change. Everybody in this room, if you're saved, you've been converted from something. <laughs> we were all sinners until we get converted. Now we still slip up, but we're not strictly a sinner once we get saved. Now we're the righteousness of God because God imputes that to us. But anyway, Tuesday night, I decided that I would go through the Christian networks that's on television, like TBN, for example, and just record every single one of those religious programs to see what their messages were here in, in election season. Yes, sir? Jeremiah, what? Jeremiah 25, uh, beginning in verse 13. So I recorded those programs, and the next day I didn't watch all of them, uh, but I would you know, watch maybe five, maybe as much as ten minutes of each one to see what their messages were. 
They were talking about things that had absolutely nothing to do with the future of America. They were talking about things that absolutely had nothing to do with repentance or with sin in this country. They were talking about just stuff you, you might have heard last June or last May or something. And here we are facing a major election. It is possible that this new justice might overturn or help the court to overturn Roe versus Wade. But even then, it wouldn't get rid of abortion because then it would go to the states. But it would help save perhaps thousands upon thousands of lives. You think about that. It just stopped full term. Well, it may be like our state, for example, might vote pro-life. It would give us an opportunity. It should never have been federalized to start with back in 1973, but it was. So if so, here's the thing. The Christians need to get off their couch and go vote pro-life. Yes, sir. So, uh, so I wrestled a lot of things uh, as far as, as pro-life and pro-choice. So I think uh, I would read the Bible, and I, 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 never, I don't believe in killing any child or any of that. Abortion is wrong. Yeah. But the whole thing is with me is I think that the better message, because I I've watched some people who call themselves pro-choice, mm -hmm. and then they're shooting people in front of a, a, a daycare center. And you're pro-choice, and you're, you're pro-life, you shoot people in front of a daycare center. I mean, uh, well, that's or, wrong, too. Right, right. right. <coughs> but that doesn't justify but, 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 but the thing yeah. is, what I'm saying is, I think the better thing to do is, I say God is pro-choice. And what he does is he tells you the, the choices. He says, choose life. Choose life. Right? But he's pro-choice, and he tells you, the, he gives you the yeah. answer to the exam. Yeah. But he always wants you to yeah. choose. So I think it's better to us to teach people that there's consequences for sin and that and that kind of way. And the pastors need to be doing that. Why? But when the government sanctions murder, right. now God's judgment will be on America. But, but the government can never legislate morality. You see what I'm saying? It's not I, I, the government's I, I, job to do that. It's our job as Christians to teach people the right and the wrong. Ultimately, the government cannot legislate right. morality. However, morality is don't kill people. Boy, they put you in jail for that. Right. Morality is don't steal, but if you're robbing bank, they put you in jail. So to a certain extent, all governments enforce morality, to a certain extent. Right. But the Bible also says God put the government up. So sometimes I say, I'm voting, but I know God's going to pick it. Not necessarily. <laughs> That's what I want to talk to you about today. <laughs> That's what I want to talk to you about. Now, I want you to look at, uh, if, if you've got your Bibles open, Jeremiah 25, verse 15. Thus says the Lord God of Israel to me, to Jeremiah, take the wine cup, this was symbolic, of, the, of this fury. So as, as if to say, here's a cup full of the fury of God. And calls all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. Well, who did God send him to drink it? Verse 16, and they shall drink and be moved. And then he talks about the sword will be among them. Verse 17, so I took the cup of the Lord's hand, this might have been in a vision, and made how many nations? All the nations to drink. So it's not just Israel that the judgment will be upon. Now verse 28, well let me go back to uh, verse 14 here. No, yeah, let me go back up to verse 14. I should have started there. Actually, I started in verse 15. Pardon me, I should have started in verse 13. Let me go back. <clears throat> I'll bring upon that land all my words which I've pronounced against it, even all that is written in this book. So you need to read what it says in Deuteronomy 28, which Jeremiah has prophesied against all the nations, for many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of them also. They're going to serve themselves. And I, God says, will recompense them according to their deeds. God is, uh, is going to judge America and Britain and Canada and all of the nations of Europe and all the nations of the world. Yes, sir. He may be already starting. Yeah, that could be. Verse 19, Egypt, they're, they're Gentile, but he's going to judge them. And uh, verse 20, and all the mingled people and all the kings of Uz and Philistines, Ashkelon, Azza, Ekron, the remnant of Ashdod, these are the people that the judgment of God is coming on. Edom, Moab, Ammon, Ammon, but it's, they pronounce it Ammon today. All the kings of Tyre and Sidon and all the kings of the isles which are beyond the sea. The sea was the Mediterranean. Dedan, and, and I won't read all those. But anyway, he mentions Arabia. The Arabs, they're going to get it. Verses 24 and 25 and 20, 26. Let's read 26. And all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another. And all the kingdoms of the world which are upon the face of the earth. So when we read these judgments... In Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, it applies to our country. Wherever you're at in the world today, it applies to your country. 
That's going to happen. Now, verse, 20, not verse 28, it shall be if they refuse to take the cup, I don't want to be punished. Then you shall say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, you're going to drink it. <laughs> you can say, I don't want to be judged. Well, God wouldn't judge America because it's our country. But Rome said, Rome is the eternal city. Rome will never fall. But it fell. In AD 476, the western part of the empire fell flat. It hasn't recovered. So verse 29, now listen to this. And I'm going to read a footnote in my reference Bible, which really is accurate. Listen to this. For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city, which is called by my name. And should you, you Gentiles, be utterly unpunished, you shall not be unpunished. For I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, says the Lord. Now, my footnote here says the scope of this great prophecy cannot be limited just to the invasion of Nebuchadnezzar against the Jews. What this is saying is, if Jehovah does not spare his own city, should the Gentile nations imagine that there's no judgment for them? Now listen to this next statement. And I agree, Schofield is considered a reputable scholar. The prophecy that we just read leaps to the very end of this age. This applies to our day today. It's going to happen. Now America is more accountable than other nations. We have religious TV, we've got religious radio, we have churches on every corner. At least that's the expression we use because there's so many. I mean, you could go blindfolded and walk into a church. You go up this road, there's one up there on the left. Go across the railroad track, there's one right in front of you. We got churches on both corners of this building. Well, yeah, that's true, too. We got churches on both corners of this building. So there are churches everywhere. Yeah, I forgot about that one right down there. You could just almost throw a baseball and hit them. So we got churches everywhere. We are more accountable than the people in India who's never seen a Bible. You can't hardly, I say, can't hardly go into a motel room without finding a Bible. You open the door, there's the Bible. Or it used to be that way. I haven't been in too many motels in recent years. Now, America is more accountable because we have more knowledge. But where does the Bible say that? You may want to go with me to Luke 12. And here's what Luke 12, 42 says. The Lord said, now he's primarily here talking to Christians. Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord, so this man's a Christian, shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. Of a truth, I say, he'll make him ruler over, the, over all that he has. But if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming, and then he goes out and backslides. He, he ends up beating the, his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. So he's just backsliding. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looks not for him, and in an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder. The margin says will cut him off. And will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Where do the unbelievers ultimately end up? A lake of fire. Now, I know this contradicts what Charles Stanley said in his book entitled Eternal Security, where he said, no matter, after you get saved, no matter what sin you commit, you can never be lost. He, and he said this. is in the book. Get it yourself. It's called Eternal Security. He said, even if you reject Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're still saved. It's in the book. I've got it at home. I can bring it and read it to you next week if you don't believe it. I can show it to you. You can read it yourself. Yeah. Yeah, takes away your free will, supposedly. But what does this say? Here's a person who calls Jesus his Lord. He talks about his Lord coming, but he's not ready. This is a serious thing. But this is not in the, uh, the Bibles of the once saved, always saved groups. It's not in their Bible, because if it was, they couldn't believe that. <laughs> I'm being a bit facetious. They just don't read it, or they skim over it. They don't know what it means. If, if we will ultimately have our portion with the unbelievers, is that something you want? No. And that servant who knew his Lord's will. Now, here's where I was coming to about accountability. That servant, and by the way, let me back up just a little bit about it. once saved, always saved. Yes, we do have eternal security in Jesus. As long as you're in Jesus, you can slip up. Look what David did, but he still got forgiveness. So, yes, you don't lose your salvation. And a lot of people say, well, if you don't believe in eternal security, you think you commit one sin, you're, you're no, 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 no. You're, you're under God's grace. As long as... You remain in Jesus Christ because he's your Savior. Well, one guy said he said, I think he said he's from God's prison. Yeah. First John 1 9, he'll forgive you. But now listen to verses 47 and 48 about accountability. That servant who knew his Lord's will, but he didn't prepare himself, neither did he do according to his will, he'll be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not, 
he was ignorant, he was uninformed, and did commit things worthy of stripes, he'll still be punished, but with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. Do you understand now? You're more accountable. Even men who have committed much of him, they will ask the more. Even men do that. If, if, if I've got an employee and that employee only knows this much, I don't expect much out of him. But I've worked with this one guy, let's say, for two or three years. I expect him to do a lot more. And so Jesus says, God is the same way. You're more accountable for what you know. If God punished Israel, they couldn't even read and write. A lot of them, they were illiterate. They didn't have Bibles. To read a Bible, you had to go down to the temple and let the priest read it to you. They didn't have Bibles at home. They didn't have a printing press. We are many times more accountable than ancient Israel, and God punished them. Jesus tells us, in, and I won't turn there, but Matthew 10, verses 41 and 42, he says that you get the same reward of those whom you support. Now think about who you vote for. You get the same reward. Now people say, well, they're all bad. Well, then pick the lesser of two evils. You pick the lesser of two evils. But you need to vote pro-life or stay home and don't vote at all. Because if you vote for someone that you know is pro-death, pro-homosexual, pro-abortion, let's kill all the babies, uh, they call it, they have a very sweet name for it. They call it women's reproductive rights. I'm all in favor of reproductive rights, but not if it involves murder. And that's what it is. See, can God forgive? Yes, he can. But it, that doesn't make it give us license. Go ahead. I was watching. Don't step on the gas. Oh, thanks. On Thursday is whenever at the Amy Coney Barrett hearing is when they had witnesses. And they had this woman come up to testify in favor of abortion. And she gave some background on her life, which was tragic. She was molested by her stepfather, mm -hmm. and, and her mother didn't believe her. And I get that. That's her mother's generation, and, and her mother, it, they were in she, the girl said they lived in poverty in West Virginia, and her mother probably so. needed that stepfather for support, financial support or a place to live or whatever. But the girl said that they finally believed her and got her out of that situation mm -hmm. and then these are her words she said that at 16 she found herself in a she was in a loving relationship mm -hmm. with her boyfriend mm -hmm. and got pregnant well my thing and then she said but her mother she couldn't tell her mother because she wanted an abortion and her mother wouldn't take her to get an abortion so she went to her school and the teachers at her school helped her without her parents' consent go get an abortion. Yeah, that's horrible. But my whole, si my whole problem with her, and she said, and she wouldn't have the life that she had today if she had not gotten an abortion. My whole problem with that situation is, instead of facing the consequences of her actions, she chose to murder that baby. Mm -hmm. And at 16, she knew how she was going to, she knew what it took to get pregnant. Yeah. And if she had enough omen, to go to her teachers to help for them to help her get an abortion, why didn't she take that same onus to go to her teachers and say, hey, I'm a sexually active teenager in high school. Mm -hmm. Help me get some birth control. Yeah. Because the, the problem is, like I said, yeah. is because she thinks the consequence is having a bad, a bad life. But that's not the consequence. The consequence of murder is that, you know what I'm saying? They don't give you the other side of it. There are consequences on the yep. other side. And, and it's our job to let them know that there's consequences on the other side. So she was just oblivious on the, of the other side of the consequences. Mm -hmm. So she thought that the consequences of life was more important because that's all the consequences she knew. Exactly, but why didn't somebody at her school, or why didn't, if she thought enough of her teachers to go to them to help her murder her baby, then why didn't yeah. she think enough to maybe go yeah. get some counseling from yeah. her teachers? Well, let's take one more, then we got to continue. It's not a question. It's, it's an answer. Mm -hmm. The problem is these people are in ignorance. They're ignorant, Sam. They have ignorance. not been taught right. that life begins at conception. Right. And they yeah. haven't. And the teachers have not been right. taught. And even if if they knew it, they're they rejecting, yeah. rejecting God yeah. and choosing the easy way out. Yeah. But a lot of times the teacher's hands are tied. Where they can't say, "Hey, you've well, got an option." They might choice. not can't say that, right? 
but they don't have to help her with that. Exactly. Yeah. We are accountable for our actions. We are accountable for, yes, ma'am. I have one more thing to say. Okay, all right. Yeah. Of fiction. Yeah, yeah, product of conception. So a lot of times with people, it's not like, oh, I'm just going to just go and just get rid of this baby for selfish mm -hmm. reasons. No. And yep. they just don't really think, oh, well, it's, I'm not really trying to moderate it. It's a blob of tissue. Yeah. And then a lot of times also things happen in people's lives that, like what you were just saying, mm -hmm. it's the consequence of having – child yeah. based on how you may have been raised or something yeah. so I mean it's like I know now that yeah that was a baby yeah. it wasn't a blob of tissue yeah. but I think what we have to do is actually teach people the truth yes we should teach them, and I mean it's we, God and it starts at home that the churches ought to be teaching churches ought to be. the churches are not doing their job yeah. And God's going. That's why God is going to put judgment on the church first. Every church in America ought to be talking about this, but they're not. I, I agree with one hundred percent about that about the churches. But I'll say, the fathers should be teaching their children at home. Yeah. They should be learning what is godly. Absolutely. What it does mean to say I'm a Christian. It yeah. don't mean I believe. Yeah. Just I believe. Yeah. And, and leave it at that. Yeah. You're safe, period. Yeah. There's more to it than that. Yeah. And they should be teaching. They should be but teaching. But they're not. Yeah. Satan, you remember the, the old letter from Paul Harvey? How he said if he was Satan, he'd be Oh, yes. yeah. yeah Paul that? Harvey, I remember that. Right. Yeah. Well, he, he said he would destroy the, the family. Yeah. Yeah. Look at how the families have been destroyed since the early 50s yeah. and it's getting worse and worse and worse yeah it's, so that's true there's no education and coming from the fathers and the fathers have not stepped up and yeah. took not control but, but responsibility. took responsibility yeah. of raising their kids godly yeah and you're supposed to raise your children godly and god will hold you accountable because a lot of young ladies that i talk to now uh -huh. Because of what I saw, <coughs> my father was, and all of that, it was like, ew, who yeah. wants to get married? Who wants to have children when yeah. they have this horrible example? I know what they have bad examples. It's not like it was when I was a kid, leave it to Beaver, where they had a good example. Oh, this is what marriage is like. This is what home is like. Or father knows best, which a lot of people today don't even know what that is. Anyway. Oh, there was one comment, which probably Bill Linton was saying that people need to watch the movie Unplanned. It deals with the same issues that Unplanned. we're talking about. This unplanned is about that movie. Is that movie about that girl that was a high up in Unplanned Parenthood? Oh yeah. And she saw an abortion happen, and that flipped her switch just like that. That's right. She did that movie un Unplanned. Yeah, yeah. And I heard her speech too. Man, she was something else. I've got that DVD. If we want to have a movie night here, and we could have it. We could do. We could do that. Yeah. I won't turn there, but First Peter five seventeen says judgment begins at the house of God. And I've already shown you what the house of God is. First Timothy 3, 15, the house is the church. Ezekiel warns us for the last days. By the way, Ezekiel is written for the last days. He's talking about a future captivity of Israel when Israel at that time was already in captivity. So he's writing about the last days. And also Ezekiel 5, he gave statistics of, of how many people would die and how they would die in the last days. And I, I was a volunteer fireman some years ago, and, they, and we had a man come in there showing us the United States military or Pentagon or somebody has determined how many people would die if the Russians attacked us and we had a nuclear attack. One third would die in the, in the attack, the initial attack. Another third would die from the resultant famine, lack of food, and there'd be about one third left. Ezekiel 5 gives you the same statistics. 
Wow, that is amazing. So he's writing for the last days. Now here's what Ezekiel says, and I'm going to turn and read this to you. In Ezekiel 9, again, this is a prophecy now for the last days, and, and Christians need to pay attention to this. It applied in his day, of course, but it specifically applies to us. Chapter 9, Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 4, The Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men. Listen that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Does homosexual marriage make you just say, ah, abortion killing little babies? 4,000 will die today, little babies, legally. Yes, sir. Everything in God's word is for today. Yeah, it's all applicable to today. Everything. Absolutely. But does it make you sigh and cry when you see what's going on in our nation today and how our government is anti-God. Let's throw God out of the classroom. Let's get rid of prayer. Let's get rid of the Ten Commandments. Does that make you sigh and cry? If you say, oh, well, no big deal. You better start learning to sigh and cry for the abominations done in this country. Verse 6, here's what's going to happen in the last days, so pay attention. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but don't come near any man upon whom is the mark, the mark of God, and begin at my sanctuary. Kill him. God is a God of justice. He can't be a God of holiness if he's not a God of justice. And then, when you repent, he's a God of mercy. We have to understand all of that. So begin at my church. Now, let me read you something from the New Testament here. Do you know that whoever you vote for, you... Uh, God's going to reward you for who you vote for and how you vote and so on. And second, John and verse 10, it says, if somebody does not abide in the true doctrine of Christ, don't let them into your house. That doesn't mean they can't walk in the front door and get a, get a glass of water. What it means is, remember Matthew 10, if you receive them into your home, it meant you sponsor them, you put them up, you pay for their room and board. In other words, you are sponsoring that man. If any come to you and have not this doctrine, don't receive him into your house. Don't bid him Godspeed. May God speed you on your way. May God help you. May God bless you in what you're doing and you're preaching false doctrine. But we're doing the same thing when we vote for pro-abortion candidates and pro-homosexuals and pro this and pro that and anti- the anti-God people, listen, let me tell you something. My vote won't, won't change the election, and neither will your vote, but it counts in heaven. What if a million Christians say my vote doesn't count? Now it counts. If every true Christian would vote for only, and I know some of the pro-life candidates, I mean, let's take, for example, Donald Trump. He, uh, he's got a mouth on him, and uh, there, he's shot himself in the foot over and over and over and over. And I'm not, I'm not attacking, I'm just saying that I understand why a lot of people say, oh, man, who's that guy? But you know what? Any election, it's a, it's a vote between two evils. You've got to pick the, the, the lesser of two evils. If he could get more people in the Supreme Court in the next four years that are pro-life, we could turn this thing around and save millions of children over the next 10, 20 years. Since Roe versus Wade was made in January of 1973, America has murdered 61 million of its citizens. And we say Hitler was a monster. He killed 6 million. America has killed 61 million. And yet Christians sit back and watch television and say, I'm not going to vote. I'm not going to vote. Or if they do vote, they vote for abortion. And God will hold us accountable. And 3 John, across the page here, 3 John verse 8, it says, We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers. What? To the truth. Fellow helper here in Greek means Partners. We have to partner with those who are doing the right thing. But now here's what some Christians say. It's a sin to vote. They think it's spiritual fornication. Revelation 17 calls the Roman church a harlot, not because that she was involved with politics per se, but because of the same reason that Israel's called a harlot, compare Ezekiel 16, because of paganism. That's why they were a harlot. That's the reason Rome is called a harlot. And that doesn't nullify our, our citizenship. We still should be citizens. Remember, now we've been told, and I was in this church that said it was a sin to vote. You can't run for public office. Well, then why did God participate in a sin by making Joseph the prime minister of Egypt? Why did God participate in a sin to make Daniel the prime minister of Babylon? And both of these were godless, pagan governments, and yet God put his man in office. Think about that. 
It is not wrong for a Christian to run for government. Dear me, I wish they were all Christians. But if everybody agrees that, well, well, a Christian can't be involved in government. All we got is atheist left. Jesus is going to be on top of the throne. That's right. That's right. Christ will rule in the end. But in the meantime, what did Paul say? Pray for all those who are in government. Not because they're nice and they're good. Pray for all the kings and all who are in authority that we may lead a peaceable life. One thing we will say for, for Trump, he has done a lot for the evangelical community. He's done more. We don't want to lose our religious freedom. Folks, if we lose our religious freedom, the first people who are going to be persecuted is people like us. We're trying to keep God's commandments. We're teaching morality. I mean, it's a wonder I'm not thrown off of the radio stations. By the way, at 12.30 today, AM 960, it's also on FM, but I forget what it is. 105.7. Thank you. 105.7. You can listen. My broadcast is pretty strong today. Yeah, it is. Have you heard it already? Oh, yeah. When you sent me the link, I listened to it. You yeah. may get thrown off today. I may get thrown off today. So listen today. It may be the last time you get to hear it. <laughs> For those of you in other countries or, or uh, in the United States, you can't get it locally. You can get it over uh, www. Truthnetwork.com and it goes coast to coast, so you have to click on the Charlotte station. It'll say stations. You click on the one that says Charlotte. It's hard to get on the radio. Yeah, it's hard for me to get on the radio even here. So I'll listen to it online at 12:30. I'll listen to it on the radio. But if you hear 105.7 with rock music on it, you're going to have to go to the 960 AM because they overlap in our area. Yeah, sometimes they overlap. But, in if, area. but yeah. if you don't want to do the inter go to the, your computer to the internet, you can go to the TuneIn app. You can download from your app store and listen to 960 on from the or the Truth Network from the TuneIn app in the app store. Okay, I hope they all got that. Yeah, that's what I do. I listen on my phone. What I'm what I'm saying is, it's not a sin if you can turn things around and do the better. The Bible says, "Don't withhold good when it's in the power of your hand to do it." If it's in the power of my hand to put to, to circle that one little oval and vote pro-life, I'm going to do it. There's a question. And God will hold us accountable. I hope it's a quick one here. Go ahead. Well, it might not be quick, and I don't know if you want to answer it now or if you want to answer it later. Well, but go ahead and ask it real quick. Wendy's asking, what's the difference between voting for a leader that's pro-life concerning abortion and pro-choice, if you will, when it comes to killing African Americans? Ah. Yeah, uh... What's the difference between voting pro-life or voting pro-choice when it comes to African Americans? When it, whenever, if it's whenever, it's pro-choice, if you will, when it comes to killing African Americans. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure if I understand the question, but let me say this. I did a, a little study into how many African American babies have been killed as opposed to, to white babies. Three times more per capita. Three times more. Planned Parenthood. What's that? Yeah, but I'm talking about right now. Let's, let's, in other words, they've got an organization called Black Lives Matter. What about baby lives? What about those lives? When three times, where are Planned Parenthood clinics mostly situated? In minority neighborhoods. Go back and read the founder of Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger, who said things that I can't repeat here because they were so nasty. She hate, She was a racist. And Hitler praised Margaret Sanger, and he got his ideas of eugenics. That's what it was called in those days from Margaret Sanger to kill six million Jews. So she, the founder of Planned Parenthood, is partially responsible for the Holocaust. And she is very much responsible for the American Holocaust. So, so black lives matter, but hey, don't, how about the babies? When three times, there are three times more per, per, per capita, 13% of Americans are African American, there should only be 13% then, but it's three times more than what's in the white. Thing. So, yeah, Black Lives Matter, but that's why we need to be voting pro-life to stop the slaughter of all of these lives. White, black, Asian, but it's mostly, they're, they're, they're aborting African babies. Because Margaret Sanger was a racist. We as Christians must vote pro-life. If we don't, then we're contributing to Margaret Sanger's dream. Now, somebody says, well, but... I don't care for the, those who are pro-life. Isaiah 45, one, God calls Cyrus his anointed. Cyrus was a pagan king. He was worse than any president we've ever had, probably. But yet God says, he's my anointed, I chose him. In Israel, they recently minted a new coin with Cyrus on one side and the president of the United States on the other because he's done so much for Israel. They just did that. 
<clears throat> now, one of the reasons that some Christians will not vote at all is because of Daniel 4, verses 17 and verse 25. And for time's sake, I won't turn there and read it. Where God chooses our leaders. Yes, he does choose our leaders. But God works through human instruments. Let God use you. Let God use you as a tool. Let him use you. Yes. We should, should do everything we can to turn this nation around. I've got one vote. That's all I've got. The word vote means voice. I've got one voice. But I can use that one voice. See, my voice registers in heaven. I may vote for, the, for, for pro-life and pro-Christian principles, and nothing happens down here. But something happened in heaven. God registered my vote. So it does count. And, I, and I'm a partner. What's that? The book of remembrance. There is, yeah, he puts your name in a book of remembrance. That's absolutely true. Don't, now, here's what P Paul said. I won't turn there, but 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 4, he says we're to pray for our leaders. That's all they could do. They couldn't vote for Caesar. They had to take whoever came down, and then all they could do is pray. But you can do more than pray. Yes, pray. But don't, and this is what, I'm not talking to probably anybody here, but there are people online that are watching and there are other people that believe that it's wrong for a Christian to vote. Let's just pray. Look, that's all they could do in Paul's day. You can pray and vote, and you should. You should, but you need to be informed. Let me, let me give you a scripture here, and I've got a little story I want to tell you. Some years ago, I heard my uncle. My uncle was a preacher, and this was back in the 60s when I heard him tell this story, and I never forgot it. It was about these two ladies who were praying. Where they lived, there was a liquor store that had just been built across the street, and these were teetotaler ladies. Oh, they hated any kind of alcohol. So they said, Sister, one of them said, the other, Let's pray. That, let's get on our knees and pray together that God will cause the liquor store to burn down. So they got on their knees and they prayed and they prayed, and this went on week after week, and nothing happened. And one night, one of the little old ladies opened up her window and, and she heard the fire trucks. Guess what? The liquor store was on fire. Woo, she was so excited. So she got on the telephone, and she called the other lady. She said, look out the window, sister, because they were living close together. She said, the liquor store is on fire. God has answered our prayers. And the other lady said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, aren't you excited? Yeah, that God has answered our prayers? She said, yes, sister, but you know, God did answer our prayers, but sometimes you have to put legs on those prayers. Do you get it? <laughs> she put some legs on this prayers. So let's pray. I <laughs> love the later action. Let's pray. <laughs> but let's do what we can do also. God helps those who help themselves. Not that you're advocating burning down. Yeah, I'm not advocating you out burn a liquor store down. But the, there's the principle there. Our <laughs> Lord. Uh, I've read the insurance policy. <laughs> I'm not covered. <laughs> now, Acts 22, verse 22, it is not wrong to take advantage of your citizenship. They, they listened to what Paul had to say, and then they, and, and then they said, oh, away with such a fellow. It is not fit that he should live. That's what people say about babies. Well, it's not fit that they should live, you know, mm -hmm. because, it, because of the way they were impregnated. And they cried out and cast off their clothes and threw dust in the all oh, They're throwing a protest. So, verse 25, they bound Paul, and they were going to scourge him. And Paul said, wait a minute, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman citizen? I have citizenship. And he said, are you a Roman? Yep. <laughs> verse 27. So, he, the chief captain said, with a great sum, I've obtained this, this freedom. He said, I was born that way. I was born a Roman. My, his father had, had gotten it. So... <clears throat> In verse 26, he said, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. He exercised his citizenship, and we have the right to do the exact same thing. We can exercise our citizenship. Now, 40 men conspired to kill him. You read that in chapter 23, verse 13. 40 men conspired to kill Paul, but he was protected, I love this, by the government at the state's expense. Verse 23, he called this uh, man here, called unto him two centurions, saying, make ready 200 soldiers, because they were going to try to kill Paul. So even though he was the government, and he was a heathen, and he was not a Christian, he said, we're going to protect Paul. 
Make ready 200 soldiers to go to Caesarea and horsemen 70 and spearmen 200. So 200 spearmen, 200 horsemen and 70, uh, 70 horsemen and 200 uh, soldiers and 200 spearmen. And provide them beasts that they may set Paul on and bring him safe to Felix the governor. At taxpayers' expense, <laughs> they protected the apostle Paul. It is not wrong to be a citizen. I knew a preacher some years ago who gave up his American citizenship, got rid of his social security number, and that was a shame. He didn't need to do all that. Verse 27, I'm concluding now. This man was taken to the Jews and should have been killed to them. Uh, then came I with an army and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. Citizenship has its privileges. In conclusion, let me say this to you. It's, a, it's attributed to Edmund Burke, and he was born way back in Dublin, Ireland in 1729, so he's a long time ago, 200 years ago. But Edmund Burke made this, almost 300, he made the, it is attributed that he made this statement. The only thing needed for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. You sit down, I ain't going to vote, my vote doesn't count. If all good men do nothing, evil will triumph. And then finally, back in 2016, Ben Carson, who is a Christian, he's also a surgeon, he's a medical doctor, and being a Christian, he said this at the Republican convention. Now listen to what he said. He was running for president at the time. The secular, this is what he said, quote, the secular progressive agenda is antithetical, that means it's opposite, to the principles of the founding of this nation. Progressive refers to the liberals, the left. And if we continue to allow them to take God out of our lives, out of the school system, out of everything, God will remove himself from us. Now, notice what he said, if we allow, if we sit back and do nothing, if we allow them to take God out of our lives, God will remove himself from us, we will not be blessed, and our nation will go down the tubes. And we will be responsible for that. He said, we don't want that to happen, end of quote. I agree with him. Yes, sir. So I'm teaching uh, at a place that's a prison camp for boys, and uh, one of the teachers we were short of teachers, and I had to teach social studies. And part of the social studies curriculum was religion, and I was teaching about Judaism, so I had to teach Judaism. And I started teaching the boys, and I was talking about Abraham, none of them ever heard of it. Hadn't heard of Abraham? No. Oh, These God. were Jewish I boys? Never did. <laughs> These are all American kids. Not Jewish boys, but American kids. I didn't know who Abraham never was. Never heard of Abraham. Never heard of none of this stuff. How old are they? They were 14, 15, 16 wow. kids. Wow. Never heard of any of the stuff that I was talking about. That was I went on a mission trip to West Virginia, right. uh, in Cameron, West Virginia. And what we did was we went and taught vacation Bible school at this church in the morning. And in the evening, we had revival at this church. Well, the kids that came to Vacation Bible School were the kids from were poverty stricken off that mountain, off the Backwoods Mountain. We had to like park down on the main road and mm -hmm. hike up the mountain to get to that church that was so backwoods. Yeah. These kids had never heard of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But whenever I they had never heard of Jesus. Yeah. 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 They have no clue. In <coughs> retrospect, they can teach you a whole lot about every sports figure. Right. <coughs> right. Yeah, they right. know sports. They knew Santa Claus, right. but right. they didn't know right. Jesus. Right. Right. Yeah. When I was they in first and second grade, right. before they threw prayer out of the school, we prayed. We had to memorize scripture. Right. We, in fact, our teacher said, "Don't ever tell a lie." Gee, you know, year Jesus. Did they take it out in '53? What amount of years did they take about like? They took it out in '62. Uh, '62. Was that like a generation away? Well, yeah. see, in Canapa City School, had no clue about none of that. Yeah. In Canapa yeah. City School, they yeah. teach Bible as an elective. Right. So that's that's a good thing. It, but it's a part of the history department. Now the whole deal is what I what I, so I talked to one of the boys, and I because I can't petition it. The kids have to do it because if I'm a teacher, I say. You get, so I had a kid say that a petition for a class, a Bible study class. And, and I go on Sundays also sometimes to teach a Bible study class free of, free of charge. But, but without being a, they allow me to do it. God allows me. But these kids have never heard of any of this stuff. And that's pretty much why they're in prison, because they have no morality. Yeah. They don't understand any morality. They, yeah, it's amazing. I heard Creflo Dollar say he didn't know that fornication was a sin. He got saved, and somebody told him he was going to a prayer meeting, and they said, uh, well, you you got to quit doing that. You're a Christian now. He said, 
You mean that's wrong? <laughs> Never heard the term. Never, I'll tell you, America has gone very yeah. far. Yeah. We, we've gone far. And, and you go back, before 1962, it was a different nation. Right. Since 1962, we've become anti-God. Right. And we will be punished. Let me give you one final scripture, and I'm going to dismiss you. I'm sorry well, for holding you a little bit late. Before you dismiss, there's uh -huh. an update on Randy Freed's nephew from one of the prayer requests. Okay, what's the update on his nephew? Well, I'll tell you what, let me finish. I've got one more scripture, and then you find that. And, and then she'll read that, and we'll be dismissed. But um, I've already quoted this, but let me actually read it to you. This is what the inspired word of God says. Withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it's in the power of your hand to do it. If you were a Christian running for office, it would be a good thing if Christians would vote for you. You'd want them to vote for you. Don't withhold good. Because you see, they're due. they have a right to expect us to support them. If we don't support them, then we're, we're actually helping the devil's crowd to get in there and kill more children. Who knows where this is going to end if we don't put a stop to it now. I hope we get enough pro-life judges on the Supreme Court that we can turn this thing around. How many more millions of Americans we would have if they had never done that in 1973. So we need to see the Supreme Court change. And in the next four years, hopefully one or two or even three more Supreme Court justices could be put on the Supreme Court. We could stop the murder of the unborn. We could stop it. So here's what it says. Withhold not good from them to whom it is due. And, it, and, and our vote is due to support Christian candidates when it's in the power of your hand to do it. Don't withhold good. So, yes, it's not wrong for a Christian to vote. And, yes, we should vote. But make sure you're voting the way Jesus would if he was going to vote. All right. Do, what's the statement there? Could you just tell us what it says rather than read it? It's us? long. Well, if it's real long, that's fine. I can read fast. Okay, read fast. I asked him how his, it's for just a recap, his, his nephew was born, his sister was a couple weeks old, and he had to be rushed into heart surgery, newborn. Um, he said he's, I asked him the other day how he was doing, he said he's doing a bit better, but they, and they were able to close up his chest and are fixing to monitor him. They found another issue, something is wrong with his vocal cords that are causing him problems and has something to do with his eating, but the doctors are confident they will get everything worked out. It's just really stressful for my brother and his girlfriend hoping that they can come home soon and put all this behind them. So they found something wrong with the baby's vocal cords making it hard for him to eat now in addition to having the heart surgery at just a few days old. So you know, if, you'll, if you guys will you know, remember them. Yeah. And, and he, Randy was saying that his brother could use prayers as well for yeah. their home. Right. The Bible says pray for one another. Okay, good. Yeah, pray for, for his name is Randy Fries. Randy, it's his, it's his nephew. nephew. Yeah, pray for them. God in heaven, we ask you to heal that little baby. We ask you to bless him and heal him. Heal the problem. You know what the problems are, dear God. And we rebuke any, any evil spirit that's hurting or oppressing that baby. We ask you now to heal him. And we as a group, we're in agreement together. We are your people. We come before you, before the throne of God. And we ask you to heal that child. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 It's done. You're dismissed. God bless you. Good to see everybody. Well, and thanks for your comments. There's a comment. There's a comment that came in while we were there. But you're dismissed. You go ahead. I think we have to be careful about hinging our vote on one particular sin. God doesn't place murder over murder. Murder is not one of them. Right, don't vote. <laughs> what was that last scripture? Proverbs 3.27. It's on the left page. You got Schofield, right? Yeah.